Spring 2017 Jack Mullen Lecture, um, and it's sponsored by the Department of Economics and the UMBC Social Sciences Forum. So before I introduce today's speaker, I, I do want to mention two forthcoming events. Um, since the Mullen Lecture is actually the next to the last talk in the Social Sciences Forum series, I want to mention that the final talk is actually going to be this coming Wednesday, and it's on a, talk, a, a topic at least tangentially related to today's uh, topic. Uh, Ann Rubin from the History Department will be presenting the Lippitz Lecture on Confederate Hunger, Food and Famine in the Civil War South. Um, and this coming fall, that we normally have the Mullen Lecture in the fall, and for a variety of reasons, we recently have been doing it in the spring. But anyway, we're trying to get back to the fall uh, installment of bringing in distinguished uh, economists, which is the uh, purpose of the Mullen Lecture. And um, our the uh, person we have lined up for this is Deirdre McCluskey. And so she's tentatively scheduled for some time in the last half of October. And stay tuned for, for further details on the exact dates uh, on that. Um, so today's speaker, Robert Margo, is professor of economics at Boston University and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard University, where his Supervisor was Nobel laureate Robert Fogel. Uh, before coming to Boston University, he has taught at the University of Pennsylvania. I can't resist mentioning that he was also the Banffy Vintners Distinguished Professor at Colgate. Uh, I haven't asked him what effect that had on his wine cellar, but um, um, I understand there's some sort of direct connection with that. Uh, but he wasn't there that long before he moved on to Vanderbilt, where he did a lot to build up the economic history program at Vanderbilt, and then has now moved on to uh, Boston University, where he's actually done a lot to build up economic history there, where I think he tells me now there's three or four economic historians at, at uh, Boston University. So his main fields of research are American economic history, but also labor economics. Uh, in both fields, he's published on a, on a broad range of topics. He is the author or co-author or co-editor of six books and around 160 articles, book chapters, and reviews. He has served as the editor of Explorations in Economic History and is a co-editor of the Southern Economic Journal. He's also been on the editorial board of not only the Journal of Economic History, but also the American Economic Review and the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Uh, in 2014 to 15, he served as president of the Economic History Association. Um, and I also want to mention that despite such prolific scholarship, uh, he also maintains a very active concert schedule as a performer on classical guitar, mandolin, and resident Renaissance and Baroque lutes. And he regularly performs uh, with the Providence, Rhode Island Mandolin Orchestra and the New American Mandolin Ensemble. I'm sure he can tell you how to get his CDs. Uh, when he was president of the American Econ of, of the Economic History Association, he actually gave a concert after his uh, presidential address. I guess he's not going to grace us with that uh, this evening, but I did want to mention that. Uh, and finally, I want to mention that the topic of today's lecture, the persistence of racial inequality, reflects longstanding scholarly interest of P Professor Margo in the economic history of African Americans. Um, his dissertation at Harvard, which turned into his first book, was on disenfranchisement, school finance, and the economics of segregated schools in the South. And his second book was on race and schooling in the South, 1880 to 1950. Uh, and I also want to mention that this actually reflects longstanding interests of American economic historians in racial uh, inequality, going back at least as far as the pioneering, if controversial book of his dissertation mentor, Robert Fogel, along with Stanley Engerman on Time and the Cross. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce Robert Margo. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very honored to be presenting the Mullen Lecture today. I want to thank David uh, and his colleagues for inviting me. This is known in the economics profession as a very distinguished lecture series with many uh, distinguished speakers before me, and so I'll do my best to live up to its reputation. Um, my talk today is based primarily on my presidential address to the Economic History Association which was published in the Journal of Economic History uh, in 2016. Every so often in this lecture, I'll be quoting uh, uh, from various people, and you'll see that the quotes come from W.E.B. Du Bois. 
in this case. Uh, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. At Boston University, I teach a variety of courses, and two courses I teach are co-listed uh, with the African American Studies program at BU. Uh, one of them is called Economics 363, and it's intended for undergraduates. And it's a course in US economic history, which is quite common uh, at American universities. You'll find a course like this at many universities. Um, but you won't find one like mine, because mine emphasizes to a much greater extent than other similar courses um, race. It emphasizes slavery, the post-Civil War South, the Civil Rights Movement, and contemporary inequality. Um, I also teach a course for master's students, Economics 569, and that is a research-oriented course on topics in African-American economic history. People write research papers, um, read content current work, and so on. I arrived at BU from Vanderbilt. I had taught at Vanderbilt for quite a number of years. Um, I arrived, at, I arrived at, uh, at BU in 2005, in the fall of 2005, and I was scheduled to teach the master's course my first semester. And I was concerned about enrollments because when you're a faculty member and you move to a university, you're an unknown quantity. You never know who's, if anybody, you hope people show up the first day, but you have no idea if anybody's going to show up the first day. And in fact, people showed up the first day, and the course stayed full for the remainder of the semester. Um, the first day, as it happened, occurred very soon after Hurricane Katrina. And the storm, as it's known in New Orleans, was on everyone's mind. Um, and that was true of two students that I had in the class. One of the students was an African-American male. He was a recent graduate from Xavier University, which was terribly uh, hit by uh, Katrina. And another was a, a, a white female student from Tulane, which was also very much affected. I, I don't know the faculty members here remember this, but right after Katrina, um, <coughs> there were huge numbers of college students that were displaced from New Orleans around the country, and they attended universities in their home cities. We took in quite a few people at BU, and I imagine that was also true here. Um, I want to recall two images. Uh, one, one is going to be from uh, Katrina, and another will be a little bit a few more years later. Um, and they, they, they illustrate contrasting images of uh, the economic character of uh, the you know, differences within the African-American community, and it'll help to motivate um, what I'm going to be talking about today. So the first is from Katrina. This is an image that millions of people around the world saw, uh, people in distress because of the storm. And a window was shown on economic conditions um, for many African Americans in New Orleans that was not a favorable window. I contrast that with this picture, which we've all seen, which is exactly the opposite. So a great deal of difference in these two pictures. What's the motivation for my talk? The motivation for my talk is that we're now a half century after the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And in our country today, racial economic differences are still very large. Um, African Americans today have lower incomes. The ratio of African American income to white income on average is a number about 0.63. So that's obviously much lower than one. Um, African Americans have much less wealth than whites, less education, shorter life expectation, and so on. And compared with the civil rights era, progress in narrowing these differences seems to have been stalled, and stalled for quite a while. Now, it's very much the case in social science that people study these differences. We study them in great detail. Um, and we study them from a contemporary perspective. I want to do a little bit different today. I want to take a long-run perspective. I want to view these differences and how they evolved over a, a very long period of time. You're going to see I'm going to start. When I say a long period of time, I don't mean like since 1990. I realize for many people in the room, that might seem like actually for many people in the room, it might seem like a long period of time from you know five years ago. But I'm talking a really long period of time. So I'm going to start right after the American Civil War. So this is like 150 years I'm going to be using. And I want, I want to do three things today. The first thing I want to point out is, is that one thing that economic historians do, economic historians um, use the tools, well, there are two types of economic historians. One type 
is an economist, someone with a degree in economics, um, that would be me or David, and then there's um, uh, economic historians in history departments who have history PhDs and they study issues from, a, from that perspective. I'm an economist, so I'm going to study it using the tools of economics. I'm going to use the quantitative tools of economics, all of them, and I'm going to use the theoretical tools of economics, all of them, to approach the past. Right? And that, can, that, that has benefits and costs, but that's, you know, that's, the, way, that's the way that I do things. Um, and one of the things we do in economic history is that we have to go back, we, we do research, but we have to review it from time to time um, as new evidence comes to light and try to decide whether we want to revise our understanding of the past. And so part of what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you what was the conventional wisdom about this long-run change, and I'm going to be focusing on, a partic on particular aspects of racial differences, and I want to revise the conventional wisdom. Right? I'm going to produce some new estimates, new numbers here, and they'll be attempting to revise the conventional wisdom. And I hope, over time, that my revisions to the conventional wisdom will become the new conventional wisdom. All right? I may, it may, I may, or, it may or may not happen. We'll see. But this is what we do um, as economists and economic historians. We constantly revisit the facts, as it were, and decide which of the facts are facts and which are alternative facts. We'll find out. Um, the second uh, goal today is I want to make intellectual sense of this evolution and I'm going to use economic reasoning uh, throughout and you'll see the use of a, some simple, well, relatively simple economic models for that purpose. And as I said, the time period here and the focus are going to be broad. I'm going to start at the end of the Civil War and I'm going to be focusing uh, very heavily on national averages um, when we look at the na nation as the whole, that necessarily obscures lots of differences that existed, differences across people, across places, and so on. All of those differences are worth studying in detail, but my focus today is going to abstract from that and look at uh, the nation as a whole. I'm going to make three points today. My first point is I'm going to revise the conventional wisdom on some benchmark estimates of ratios of black to white income ratios um, and what we're going to see is my benchmarks produce a smoother transition over time. Why this is important I'll explain as I go along. Um, I'm going to argue that to understand the evolution of the, t of the new series that I present it's very important to take what I'll call as an intergenerational perspective that's partly dictated by the fact that the time period that I'm looking at is 150 years in length. A human generation is 25 to 30 years. So over the period of time that I'm talking about is roughly five to six human generations. Intergenerational means I think about parents and children and how they are linked. It's inescapable in this context because of the length of time. Um, the third point I'm going to make is that the pace of convergence or not, or divergence that we might see, is strongly affected by many things, including things that are beyond the control of individuals or even the United States as a whole. They're affected by, for example, overall shifts in the distribution of income and the structure of wages. These shifts are not really race specific. They occur for everybody, but they have racial consequences. And I'll point that out as I get into this lecture. So here's another quote from Du Bois. Du Bois is a wonderful source of inspiration when one studies um, this particular topic. To be a poor man is hard, but to be a poor race in the land of dollars uh, is the very bottom of hardships. So many times when economists study uh, differences in, in income, perhaps between men and women, between ethnic groups, or between different racial groups, the focus is often on labor earnings. Um, and frankly, the focus is also often just on males. Right? I think these two focuses that people have are too narrow for the issue that I'm interested in. I prefer a broader measure, so my measure is going to be per capita income, so the total income divided by the population. I think this is important in this particular context because 
it so happens that African American women had much higher labor force participation rates historically and earned larger amounts of income historically than their white counterparts. And also because I can cover non-labor income, income on asset ownership, and that's important as well. Right, so my focus is broader. There is no free lunch. As we know, you're economic students, and I'm sure you've heard that conservatively several million times in your life. So there is no free lunch, so there are caveats in what I'm going to be doing. The first is that not all of the income that accrues to African Americans is necessarily consumed within the African American community. Right? There's some, you might call it leakage across different groups. It's relatively small in this case because of the nature of intermarriage, another point that I will come back. The focus on per capita income is going to obscure changes in inequality within the African American or the white population. This is actually quite an important caveat because in the last 50 years, there have been changes in inequality in the income distribution within the African American and white populations. In particular, within both populations, inequality has risen, right? I'm abstracting from this because I, the historical sources will not allow me to say anything, at least anything that I personally believe, in changes in inequality within the African American or white populations before World War II. I want to have a consistent approach here, so I'm going to abstract from changes within uh, the distribution and focus just on the averages. That comes at, as I said, at a significant cost um, but we have to have assumptions somewhere. Um, it's very important to realize that I'm going to be working with imperfect historical data. A central feature of the economic history of the United States is an improvement in the statistics with which we work. Um, over time, we have greatly improved the quality of economic data, and one example of this involves data on income. Before 1940 in the United States, there was no systematic collection of income data at the individual or household level. The 1940 census was the very first census that asked a question about people's income. And even that question was incomplete. It was a question about people's labor earnings, which was not a very good question to ask of farmers because farmers were self-employed and didn't work for anybody else, so they didn't have earnings as you might have if you work for somebody else. All the professors in this room have labor earnings because we work for somebody, whether it's the University of Maryland or in my case, Boston University. Right? So everything's gonna be based on imperfect historical data. That's what the way we work and, and what we do in economic history is we work with what we have and we try to assess the biases that arise from our analysis, and I'll try to do that as well. The last bullet point is also important. Everything I'm going to be saying here pertains to the civilian, non-institutional population. Civilian means that anyone that's in the military is not included, and non-institutional means anybody who's in an institution is not included. Now, the issues here are different than labor economists are concerned of <coughs> typically, Typically, a labor economist is concerned about the civilian, non-civilian distinction because military service might affect one's income in the civilian economy. If I'm a veteran of the military, that might affect the kind of income I would earn as a civilian. If I'm institutionalized, if I'm in, for example, jail, and I, re I get out, that will affect my earnings. My Concern here is different from that. My problem here is I have no good way to include people in these categories, for example, because it would require me to figure out what it was a good way to characterize the income of people in the military, their per capita income. I have no idea how to do this. If someone's serving in Iraq, I have no good idea how to characterize their per capita income. If someone's in jail, I don't know how to characterize their per capita income. So I am leaving them out of the picture, and that's a limitation. 
I'm going to show you now a figure which is going to give you the conventional wisdom and it's also going to show you my revisions. You'll see four series, time series. Um, one will be from the economic historian Robert Higgs, who's a famous economic historian um, who did this, the work I'm going to be talking about primarily in the 1970s and 80s. And I'll also show you data from the U.S. Census Bureau, which is, you know, not that far from here, all right, and is produced annually by the Census Bureau. I'll then show you some other series from the labor economist James Smith, another eminent labor economist, and then myself, I won't call myself an eminent economist, I'll just say it's my revisions to this work. The conventional wisdom is going to result in the following narrative. When I'm teaching classes, I like to emphasize narrative. I like to tell people what happened over time, the change that happened over time, and then try to give them a story that hangs together to explain the change over time. The conventional wisdom is that there were two periods in American history where the income differences between African Americans and whites narrowed. Just two periods. The first period was from 1870 to 1900. I'm guessing that might come as news to some people. You might not have heard of that. But you might have heard about the second, which is 1940 to 1980. 1940 to 1980 encompasses World War II, which is one period of convergence or narrowing. And it also covers the civil rights era of the 1960s. Those are the only two periods in which there's a significant or measurable narrowing of income differences between African Americans and whites. The narrowing that occurs in those periods is sustained. We don't revert to the previous level, but we don't see continuity. Right? Um, and so here's the picture. And there are, as I said, four series here. I hope you can see them. I have a laser pointer. So here you see triangles, and those are three triangles, and those are estimates of per capita incomes, African Americans to whites, so that's the ratio over here. So here's the number that Robert Higgs produced, Professor Higgs produced, and that number is roughly uh, circa 1870, and it's a number uh, around 0.24. So in 1870, according to Professor Higgs, for every dollar of income received by a white person in the United States, African Americans received about 24 cents. So it's a very large difference. <coughs> Higgs's next estimate is for 1900, and that number is about 0.35. So he's saying in 1900, 30 years later, the ratio had increased by about 11 percentage points. His final number is 1940, just before World War II. And you can see that his number before World War II is lower. It's about 0 0.3132. So from 1900 to 1940, the first 40 years of the 20th century, Higgs was claiming there was no change whatsoever. Now we pick up the census series. The census series is the squiggly line. It's very continuous because the Census Bureau produces these numbers on an annual basis. And you can see that we get a fairly steep increase here. It starts to slow down, and then it flattens out right around there. And the flattening out starts around the year 2000, and it hasn't changed since. Right? So we get a period of convergence. A period of convergence slows down, flattens out. This is going to be my revisions. My revisions start higher, a little bit lower there. More continuous, more continuous. This is going to be the final series I'll talk about. This is a series produced by the labor economist James Smith. And you can see that it's a little different. It's different from Higgs. It's also different from mine. But he also gets this increase over here. Right? So this is, this is the sum total of what we know about this particular number. Okay, this is it. Right? So what happened? What is the story, the narrative that people tell? So from 1870 to 1900, we have a number of things going on. The Civil War has ended. Right? 
And we observe a number of things. One of the things we observe is labor mobility. We, we observe African Americans who had previously been, been enslaved moving around the South. The moves that we see are moves typically from low income places to somewhat higher income places, just as people do today in the United States. We also see the beginnings of wealth accumulation. In 1870, there were virtually no African Americans who were farm owners, very small fraction. By 1900, it's about 25%. So there's the beginnings of wealth accumulation. Um, there's changes in the level of schooling and literacy. I'll come back to that. Um, but then this period ends, and historians talk about a period of repression political repression that follows the end of Reconstruction. Um, and some of this is reflected most prominently in voting rights. So in the late 19th century South, there's a period sometimes called the disenfranchisement period in which voting rights are dramatically curtailed for African Americans. Today in the United States, there have been you know, many changes in voting laws that have had the effect of altering voting turnout and so on. What we're talking about here is of a qualitatively different nature. In 1890, about half of the registered voters in the state of Louisiana were African Americans. That's what the, the statistics for the state show. In 1910, less than one-tenth of one percent. So we went from 50% to basically zero. Okay, so that is an example of a type of political oppression I'm talking about, lynching and everything that goes along with it. So between 1900 and 1940, de, de jure segregation, which is segregation by law, and de facto segregation intensifies. The Great Depression happens. The Great Depression happens is not good if you happen to be poor. You don't want to be poor in the 1930s. It's a bad, it's going to not be helpful. And so that has a negative effect. It's offset to some degree by the beginnings of what historians call the Great Migration, which is a move of people from the South, which had low incomes, as I'll talk about, to other parts of the country where incomes were higher. But these things in the, in the whole, according to the conventional wisdom, canceled th each other out, and there was no narrowing or no further improvement in this ratio. Now what happens from 1940 to 1980? The labor economist James Heckman, a Nobel Prize winner, wrote about something called episodic change. He said that there were periods of time in which racial narrowing occurred in income differences. In passing, Heckman points to the 1940s as such a period, but he mostly focuses attention on a short period of time from 1963 to 1965, the height of the civil rights movement in which we observe narrowing differences in income. In the 1940s, we see a role for World War II and migration, and also something called the Great Compression, which I'll come back to because it's the opposite of what we observe in the United States today. Today in the United States, income inequality has widened enormously in the past 30 years a huge increase in differences in income. In the 1940s, the opposite occurred. In a paper that I wrote with Professor Claudia Golden of Harvard University, we called that the Great Compression, a sort of play on the Great Depression. The Great Compression is a narrowing of income differences that occurred in the 1940s about the same magnitude as the rise in inequality more recently. If you are a person whose income was below the average in the 1940s, and you were another person above average, by the end of the decade, the differences had narrowed because of this narrowing of inequality. Also in the 1940s were the beginnings of some attempts by the federal government along to sort of enforce or begin to think about anti-discrimination policies we live in, a, we live in a, a world, you know, at the moment where there's a new executive order every, uh, what, four hours. I'm not going to comment on them, except to note that, but there were executive orders in the 1940s by, uh, by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, several of which were directed at attempting to reduce discrimination in defense hiring and certain things 
that have been shown to have been important in narrowing racial differences in income. Heckman and others point to the civil rights movement of the 1960s, federal anti-discrimination legislation that accompanied it as being important. This is a list of many people who have worked on this. Now what has happened from 1980 to the present? I mentioned rising wage inequality, persistent negative effects of housing, housing segregation is another factor that has been pointed to. There are reversals in anti-discrimination policies in recent decades, and also declines in public sector employment. Public sector employment is an important part, I don't have time to go into it, but it's an important part of the narrowing that we see in the 1960s. We also live in a period of large, much larger immigration than in the past, and there's evidence of substitution in the labor market, and mass incarceration. Right, so a long list of factors, and again, these are some of the people who worked on this. Now, I'm going to be revising this, so I want to talk briefly about how you do this. In economic history, some, some estimates of numbers are pretty precise, and they're based on a, on a quite substantial amount of data. Other stuff is back of the envelope. Sometimes the back of the envelope stuff is really back of the envelope. I mean, like scribbled on the back of the envelope. Sometimes it's a little more than that, but that's the nature of the differences. I characterize this previous work as more than back of the envelope, but not that much. So what did Professor Higgs do when he constructed these estimates? Um, he's doing it in a very simple way. He's starting with the fact that if we have the average income of people in the United States, it can always be written as a weighted average of incomes of different groups. So if I have two groups, whites and African Americans, and I have the average income within the group, the overall average is a weighted average of the two, and the weights are the population shares. So what Higgs is going to do is he's going to estimate the income of African Americans in 1870 and 1900 using a variety of data, and then he's going to back out from that equation that I just mentioned an estimate of white per capita income because he knows the average per capita income in the United States. That's a number that economic historians have determined with some accuracy. So that's how he does it. In 1940, it's a little bit different, a little more complicated, but similar in many ways. Now in my work, I, what I did was I went through all of the steps in his calculation. It was very tedious. I went through all of his worksheets, checked every number, and then I decided as I went through them that I would have done things differently. In some cases I discovered what I regarded to be mistakes. They were honest mistakes. Uh, in some cases differences of interpretation. Mm -hmm. So in particular I believe that his 1870 and 1940 estimates are too low and his 1900 is too high. And the reason was I think that he underestimated the incomes of African American farmers in 1870, and he definitely underestimated the income that African Americans got from non-labor sources in 1940. In 1940, he basically assumed that there was no non-labor income for African Americans, and that's clearly false um, because there's ownership of property. Okay. And when I corrected for this, I got the smoother path that you saw. Um, I don't really want to go through this slide because if I go through this slide, I'm guaranteed to bore you. Okay, but this slide, if you want to, I'm happy to send it to you, it will describe the process by which I went through to decide in this particular case why I thought my number was better. Um, I don't want, as I said, I don't want to go through it because it's really very tedious, but it was important. And I just emphasize that this is a this is a activity that economic historians do all the time. We're constantly reassessing the work of our predecessors. And I hope that when I'm, you know, you know, dead and gone, somebody reassesses my work, right? That none of us look at this uh, as proprietary. We're trying to understand the past and we can only do that when people are constantly checking our work and reassessing. But you can see the nature of the changes that I made in 
1870, I'm going to increase the ratio. It's not going to change it that much. In Higgs's case, it's about 0.24. Mine is about 0.28. Now, you may not regard that as much of a change, but it actually is, percentage-wise, a fairly large adjustment. In 1900, Higgs has 0.35, I have 0.31. In 1940, um, I have about 0.38, he has 0.34. If you connect the red bars, you can see that it's much smoother. Right? When I started this, I had no idea I was going to find this. Right? It, wasn't like I, it wasn't like I read Professor Higgs's work and decided, ah, he's just crazy. I'm, I know what I want to find, I'm going to find it. That's not the case. When I started this, I, wasn't, I thought maybe I would reproduce his numbers and I would agree with it. But I changed my mind as I went through, and I came up with this much smoother transition. So are my benchmarks an improvement? You bet. Okay, I think they are. Okay, but I certainly, as I said, welcome people to criticize me. Um, my benchmarks conflict, though, not just with Higgs, but with the work of James Smith. And James Smith is a very eminent labor economist. In economics, if you disagree with somebody, you have to defend yourself. You just can't just say, I disagree with you. You can only do that, I won't go into that, but you can't do that if you're in, in economics. Professionally, you have to defend yourself, okay? So I'm gonna show you why I think I'm right. So I'll go back very quickly to show you Smith's numbers again. Smith's numbers are these. They're these little squares that are on such diamond-like things, okay? Those are his numbers. And you can see there's a little bit of movement up before 1940 and then a big movement from 1940 to 1980. So he seems to get the same direction as the census and he seems to show not that much improvement there and more improvement there, okay? So somewhere in between me and Higgs. Why do I think though that He's not right. What, what am I, what's my objections to him? When people cite his work, and this is a problem that we often face in economics, we have language, and the language shows up in papers and titles, and people don't always pay close attention to what the word actually means. I know there are a lot of economics students here. I hope that you spend time reading the footnotes and the notes to tables. I hope that people teach you to do that because it's real important because the data are not necessarily consistent over time and you can make terrible mistakes if you don't do that. Okay? Now in this case, people always cite Professor Smith's work as providing estimates of the income ratio of blacks to whites. But that's not what his numbers actually tell us. They are not true income ratios. They are something else. They're called occupation status ratios. I don't know if there are people here from sociology. You've taken courses in sociology. But sociologists have a concept called occupation status. And what that means is that I take people in different occupations and I assign them a weight, a number, that reflects their relative status. And in his case, the status is entirely determined by the average income in the occupation. So a higher income is going to be higher ranked. Now, when he produced his figures, the ones I just showed you, his weights, the income weights, were the same for all of the years in his series. They never changed. They never changed. And that is really not good at all because the period of time over which his data cover involved large changes in the income distribution. So in particular, his series understates changes in the black-white income ratio before World War II because he doesn't take into account the great compression that I mentioned as well as more general wage compression that occurred during the first half of the 20th century. And it, in, in, in the other thing that he, that he does, doesn't do, is that he doesn't take into account what I'll call the erosion of spatial mismatch. Now, when we study the geography of African Americans in the 20th century, we see vast changes. In the early 20th century, 
the typical African American lived in the South. Now, the South, circa 1900, was very poor. If you were living in Naples, Italy in 1900, you were very poor too, on average. And many Italians left the poverty of their country to move to the United States in the early 20th century. On average, the per capita income in Italy in 1900 was 50% of the per capita income of the United States. So when you moved from Italy to the United States, you doubled on average. Not everybody did, but on average, people doubled their incomes. When people moved from Italy to the United States in the early 20th century, they moved to New York or Philadelphia or other places like that. They generally did not move to the South. Why is that? Because if you move, well, there are many reasons, but one reason is if you moved from Italy to the South, you weren't going to increase your income because the average income in the South was about the same as it was in Italy. Right? So Southerners were very poor, and this was true across the board on average. Um, African Americans were disproportionately in the South. So even if there were no racial difference in incomes within a state, suppose just a very, very you know, obviously incorrect hypothetical, suppose within every state in the United States, the average income of African Americans and whites had been the same in 1900, the average in the nation would still have been far less than one because most African Americans were in the South. And that's not reflected in Smith's estimates, nor is any change in this over time reflected. This spatial mismatch that I'm referring to eroded over time. It eroded over time. It became a little bit less uh, visible by World War II. And that means that his series, again, understates the change that we see. I now want to talk a bit, let me see how much time I have so I have an idea of what, uh, I, b I better speed up a bit. Um, I want to talk a bit about a model, and this is why this is intergenerational, and this is another quote from Du Bois. What on earth is whiteness that one should desire it? Then always somehow, some way, I'm given to understand that whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever. So, the implication here that's important is the convergence is smoother and more continuous. Um, and as I said, we need a model of intergenerational transmission of inequality because the period of time covers five human generations. We can't study it at a point in time because these are, over a very long period of time, the labor market keeps getting replaced by new people, the children of former generations. We have to follow the generations over time. And in particular, I'm interested in a very specific question, the role of initial conditions. Initial conditions are what obtained just after the Civil War, which is the aftermath of slavery. How long was the reach of slavery? How long did its effects last on this statistic that I'm interested in. Okay. I want a model, an economic model, that will allow me to address that. Now this is going to have a little math. I know it's late in the afternoon. You may not have had enough caffeine, but I'm going to use a little math. I'm an economist. That's what we do. Okay. I sound like the, the Geico commercial. All right. This is a type of regression analysis or a type of equation that we use in economics where a person's income is related to the income of the previous generation. And the, the number beta here is a positive number, but it's less than one. It's called the intergenerational elasticity. If my father's income was 10% higher than the average, is my income going to be 10% higher than the average or something else? That depends on the value of beta. This argument will tell us that if the average income of African Americans was less than the average in one period, it should narrow by beta in the next period. That's an intergenerational model. What does beta have to be to explain the time series that I showed you? How, how, what's the number have to be? It turns out it has to be a number equal to 0.8. 
It also has to exhibit a characteristic called exponential discounting. Now let me explain that in English. Exponential discounting means this. If the coefficient <clears throat> is 0.8 between you and your father, and it's also 0.8 between your father and his father, then the coefficient between you and your grandfather, that's two generations, is 0.8 times 0.8 or 0.64. It's three generations. It's 0.8 to the third power and so on. That's called exponential discounting. Right. No one who works in the area believes this. Nobody believes this. Why is that? It would only be the case <clears throat> if the equation that I showed you in the previous regression was what we called a truly causal explanation. That means that this variable actually causes that variable. And that's not the case. All right. um, and the other problem, an even bigger problem, is that all of the evidence that we have from every period in American history is that beta is not 0.8. It's a number like 0.5. If beta is 0.5, then the initial conditions erode over time and they no longer become important roughly after a few generations. Right? So this is a real problem in terms of explaining what's going on. Okay? Um, I'm going to go a little bit quicker and say that it's possible to solve this problem and the way I'm going to solve this problem is I'm going to consider a model that allows for the transmission of inequality, but with more structure to it. And the structure I'm going to have is going to look like this. So let me explain this. This says that your income today is going to depend on this variable h, and h is your human capital. An example of your human capital is your education. It's also going to depend on race. We live in the United States, we know it depends on race. Your race, your racial identity, depends on that of your parents. How much does it depend on your parents? It depends on this parameter here. And your human capital depends on that of your parents and also your race. Okay. So this is a little bit, looks a little bit complicated. Okay. And it's going to get even a little more complicated, but I'll just quickly point this out. This turns out to be the expression for the intergenerational elasticity. And the key point that I want to make is very simple. The model that I just put up on the board and went through very quickly has the following property. It does not have this exponential discounting. Instead, things decay very slowly. They decay very slowly because the factors that determine your income are passed on persistently. Okay. We know this is true in the United States in the case of racial identity because our country has a history of very limited racial intermarriage. All right. So racial identity is transmitted across time with a lot of persistence and we also are a country with a long and sorry history of residential segregation. Right. So that affects that transmission, and we are also a country with a long and very sorry history of educational discrimination, which also creates this persistence. Nevertheless, we have seen some change over time. Just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about here, um, let me look at one particular aspect of this that I do in the paper. I put together a time series of racial differences in years of schooling, and this is measured at age 35. So it does it by birth cohort. So this says birth cohort. This means when you were born. And you can see if you were born around the year 1900, there's a very large gap in the amount of education that you have by race. And then it narrows over time, and then it flattens out. This is extremely important right here. This has had a major effect on recent differences in earnings and incomes between blacks and whites in the United States. And this is a consequence of many things, 
okay? But one of the things that's a real consequence of is access to higher education, right? So this process of narrowing across generations has slowed quite dramatically. This seems like it's a pretty quick uh, transition. It seems like it's pretty steep. But this does not adjust for the quality of education that people have access to, particular at the elementary and secondary level. In the paper, I discuss how that taking that into account would affect the extent of convergence over time, and I argue that it would cause it to be much slower than it appears in this figure. <laughs> so I think I'm going to just go right to my end conclusion, and I'm going to then take some questions. Okay. Right. My final quote from Du Bois, America is not another word for opportunity for all of her sons. The differences that we see in the United States in economic outcomes between African Americans and whites are the outcome themselves of a very long historical process. To analyze these differences at a point in time and not understand their history to me is a mistake. We have to put them in historical perspective. We do see convergence in the long run, but the pace of convergence is slow. Slower than economists see in other contexts. And to understand this, we have to think about this process intergenerationally and how different generations were able to overcome or not the impediments that are in place. The impediments that are in place are structural, institutional, and also inherited from the past from America's greatest sin, which was slavery. Thank you. A few tokens of appreciation. Um, as many of you are aware, it's the 50th anniversary of UNBC, so we have some 50th anniversary swag. It's also getting a <laughs> sponsor, but this is uh, wow. This Our is sweatshirt. I promise that the next time I play a mandolin concert, <laughs> I will wear this. It's very fun. And you'll see the definition of economics down there using scarce means to meet competing ends. Oh. Uh, Maybe I won't wear it the next time. <laughs> Top bag and a keychain. Thank you very so, much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. But anyway, we still have time for questions, so I'll let uh, okay. Bob uh, take questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I think one of the slides that skipped over was related to uh, the wealth yes. gap. Yes. Maybe you could just give us a brief. Yes, very much. On that. Okay. So the particular model that I was developing in this paper for simplicity, it focused just on labor income. It, was, it would have been possible to integrate it with wealth, but it would have been um, mechanical, right? To do it properly, one needs um, to model consumptions and savings directly. And I wasn't prepared to do that. That's a hard problem. I can, though, very quickly survey what we know. So one of the things we know a, a, quite a lot about in terms of wealth differences is the evolution of racial differences in home ownership. This is also based on my work. This, in, this is based on my work with William Collins of Vanderbilt. I'll show you this because this actually differs, again, from the conventional wisdom. Right? If you were to go to the Census Bureau and look at the conventional estimates of home ownership by race, you would not see this picture. Okay, um, so what, what's different here? Here you see the difference that existed in 1870. You would not find that in government statistics. You can see how large it is, it's huge. You can see that it narrowed here, right? It narrowed from a gap of about 50 percentage points, 49 to be precise, to 26. This is the difference in the proportion of adult um, males who were homeowners, owner occupants. So it's about 50% goes down to 26%. Notice it declines for whites, which people are, people whenever they see this, they find very surprising. 
But what's going on here is the movement of whites from the farm, where many people owned the farm and therefore owned the home that the farm was on, and they moved to cities like Manhattan in the early 20th century, which had very low rates of home ownership. This over here is African Americans becoming farm owners, first generation, and so the gap narrows. Then you can see the gap waxes and wanes. It widens here. This is the period of suburbanization, rapid suburbanization after World War II. But then it starts to narrow again, widens again. Notice the gap here is about 23 percentage points. It's 26 percentage points here. Right? In terms of the percentage point difference, not much change in the 20th century. That contrasts with much of the discussion of this topic, which focuses very much on recent public policy, when I'm claiming as history, again, provides a unique perspective. Here's data that's for, now, home ownership is a very small fraction of the aggregate wealth distribution. Here's estimates of wealth in total, and you can see, this is going back to 1980, um, you can see, um, oops, I did this wrong, how low these numbers are. These numbers are much lower than the income ratios, right? So when we, that's one of the reasons why the income ratios are below the earnings ratios, because they incorporate numbers like this. Right? So in terms of, you know, important topics for research, this is very, very important. This used to not receive that much attention in economics, but it's now we recognize how important it is, and much more attention is being paid to this. That vertical axis, point one? Yes, that's point one. Point one. Okay, so in 1980, it's about point one. That's the ratio of African American to white average wealth. In 1980, the ratio of, what, of African American income to white income is a number like point six. So it's a, it's a very, very big difference. A lot of this has to be viewed intergenerationally as, as well. When slavery ended, you think about the next generation after slavery, there's nothing to inherit. When African Americans were enslaved, there was not a process of wealth accumulation. You can't pass land to your children if you don't have any land. So it only, it's only the process of wealth accumulation only begins after the Civil War, but up to that point there had been a century, two centuries of it. So that had a very profound effect historically, again through the intergenerational transmission. Yes, ma'am. Were there regional differences in the amount of convergence? Uh, yes, there are. Those, that's a very good question and it's very important. Um, there were, the um, convergence that we see, for example, in the 1960s is more uh, substantial in the South. The South starts lower and then it converges more rapidly. And there's much less convergence in the Northern United States during that period. That's been studied, uh, in particular more recently, by Leah Bustan, who's an economic historian uh, now at Princeton. And she points out that um, the process of African Americans moving from the South reduced the supply of labor in the South, and caused wages to go up there, and increased the supply of labor in the North, and caused wages to go down. So it gives, when you study these regional differences, you have to pay close attention to the migration that's occurring because it's affecting the numbers in that way. Yes, sir. If I understood correctly, you said that in the last 30 years, the convergence has, has slowed. slowed yes. or basically stopped. And I'm trying to understand how related to your long run model where you add um, the transmission of your racial identity mm -hmm. and your human capital somehow changes yes. to cause this. Okay, let me, that's a very good question. Again, I, I didn't, if, if I had another hour, I could go into that in detail. But let me, let me go back. And I'm going to just subject you to the, this, this math for just one more second. The critical answer to that question has to do with this. Beta sub H, which is the way in which the labor market prices human capital. So what we've learned is that that's increased in the last 
30 years, okay, that the rate of return to human capital education has gone up quite dramatically. What that means is if that there is a gap in education, if the gap in the case, you know, if, there's a, if you have education below average, relatively above average, that will widen the difference in income between the groups, and that turns out to be quite important. That does not have, this, this change here is not coming from something fundamentally racial, it's coming from something much broader than that. It's coming from technological change, which has, uh, you know, has this complementarity with physical capital, and it's coming from globalization. Okay, so it's coming from forces way beyond um, some of the things I'm talking about here, and it affects everybody, but it affects people differently depending on where you are in the income distribution. Yes? Uh, have you looked at the, this uh, ratio of income by gender? To yes. See the differences? Yes, what we know, I, I, I don't in this paper because I was trying, in this talk or in this thing because I was trying to be very general. But yes, that has been done and there are distinct differences in the uh, rate of convergence. There's more convergence for women, among women, between black women and white women. Um, one reason I look at it in total is that uh, eventually people form households, right? And you have to think about how the formation of households will affect the average that we see, right? But you're right, there, you know, there are distinct gender differences and the process of convergence, cer certainly during the civil rights period, is stronger for women than it is for men. I, I hasten to add, we can't say much about that. Well, I would love to be able to say more about that historically. And I actually tried to get a PhD students to work on this, but I can't, we don't really have answers to that particular question as we go back in time, mostly just for the post-World War II period. Yes, sir. I have heard that recently that um, the accumulation of wealth among uh, African Americans had increased, but I didn't see that on the earth. Right, so I think you may, might be referring to, there was an article in the New York Times very recently which talked about um, changing inequality within the African-American community. And I, I, early on I said I wasn't, this wasn't really directed at that. But within the African-American community in the last 30 odd years, there has been a rise in inequality um, and that's partly reflected as well in the ownership of capital, right? So that's not gonna show up too much in here uh, just because of, I don't have the, I'm not presenting the data in that way. I, I want to say though, with respect to the wealth differences that I briefly showed, you should keep in mind that when you see a picture like, see a picture like this, you wanna keep in mind that this is based on official data and official data does not include Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or our current president, okay? People like that never get into the official statistics, right? So, you know, that would change the level here, right? In ways that most people leave out because in fact the differences are so huge that they just would swamp everything. We still have food back there. And, uh, uh, thank our speaker. Thank you very much.